But okay, morning, everyone. Um, so today I'm going to talk about research methods in personality. It's not going to be the most interesting part of the course, but it's the kind of crucial part, okay, so that you can then evaluate the research and the methods used as we talk about them throughout the course. Um, if you've done a course like 3090 before or some other kind of stats course, a lot of this will already be familiar and it'll be kind of like a you know crash course reminder. Um, but it's kind of just some of the essentials that you need for understanding some psychological research. Um, and then after that, I'll probably make a start on Freud and then we'll finish his theory on Thursday. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about collecting data, um, the different types of personality research, and then the concepts of reliability and validity. So um, in personality research, there's various ways in which we can collect data. Um, the most common of which is questionnaire data or Q data. So, you know, this is going to be a type of objective test like we talked about last time. Okay, it's going to be like the big five test if you've taken that before or the Minnesota multifaceted inventory that we talked about last time or some other similar personality questionnaire in which it's an item such as maybe I am tidy and then you agree with it or disagree with it on a liquor point scale, right? So if it's a five point liquor scale, you're agreeing from strongly agree to strongly disagree. If it's a two point liquor scale, it's true or false. And you could have a three point, seven point, nine point, you know, and that would be the number of options available, but it's a ordered system which you can respond to. Now, most often this is going to be self reports, okay, S data. Okay, so again, like the tests that we talked about, the big five is usually a self-report, okay? And um, the main advantage of these tests and this type of data is that we're getting an overall big picture of the person's personality, right? So we can um, ask about them in various contexts, okay? But also, you know, only you, the individual, is probably fully aware of your thoughts and feelings and behaviors and the full number of contexts in which you you know um go through and so um that also is a big part you know so for example if we're evaluating shyness you know a lot of what shyness is is internally experienced right and it might not be evident to an observer or a friend or a researcher and so only you really can tap fully into um yourself to fully assess yourself which is the main advantage of self-reports the biggest disadvantage, of course, like we talked about last time, is that we're assuming people will be honest, that they won't, you know, fall to social desirability, present themselves in a particular way. Um, and also they might not be able to objectively measure themselves for the reasons that we talked about before as well, right? Ordering effects, unconscious uh, impacts, um, and so on. Now, another type of questionnaire or Q data is informant reports which is very similar, okay? But it's just that you're assessing the personality of someone else. So maybe a friend, maybe a relative, okay? So the question would be, you know, this person is tidy. And again, you would agree, disagree. Okay, it's the same um, response system, okay? The same kind of ordinal Likert scale response. Um, you know, this has an advantage because, you know, it's, at least in theory, you know, it's uh, a more objective source, okay, so they're not going to fall to social desirability. But of course, social desirability could still come into it. If you're assessing a friend, maybe you want to present the friend in a particular way. Um, but the main disadvantage is that you're kind of limited to the context in which you've seen the person, right? You know, if this is a colleague, for example, you know, you've seen them mainly in that context, or if it's a friend, or, you know, if it's, you know, maybe a teacher assessing a student, okay? And people behave differently in different contexts, right? You don't behave the exact same at school as you do with your friends, as you do with your family and so on, okay? So if we're only getting kind of one viewpoint into the person, it's not a big picture of their personality. Another disadvantage is that, you know, when we're thinking about someone's personality, we tend to focus on more extreme examples or, you know, times in which we were with the person that were a bit more abnormal, you know? Well, you know, in this case, this person was, you know, really, really shy or really, really outgoing. We we tend to focus less on the kind of mundane everyday experiences. Okay. 
And so that may also impact our assessment of the person's personality. Okay, so that's the types of Q data, okay, questionnaires. Um, another way of collecting data is life outcomes or L data. So this is some objective number, okay? It's not open to subjectivity or interpretation. It's an objective number that we hope gives insight into the personality traits or characteristic that we're trying to assess. You know, so maybe I want to know about how sociable you are, okay? And I think, well, maybe a way of assessing that is how many parties you went to last month, okay? That's an objective number, right? It's life data, okay? I could write, well, you went to 10 parties or four parties or one party or zero parties with the theory that that will give me some insight into how sociable you are. Now, the main disadvantage of L data is of course that many things impact um, life outcomes, right? If for example, you work on sociable hours because of a job you have, um, or you have some other responsibilities, okay? Then obviously you might not go to very many parties and that's going to impact, you know, my perception of how sociable you are. You know, maybe the score will be low, it's not because you don't like parties and so on. It's because you have these other responsibilities keeping you from these activities. But also personality traits, multiple personality traits could impact the same life outcome. You know, so for example, maybe I'm taking a measurement of someone's annual income and I think their income will give me some insight into their personality. Now, someone could have a high income because they're good at negotiations and they're pretty direct and upfront about asking for a pay rise and so on which would be a marker of low agreeableness, okay? Or they might have a high paying salary because they're hardworking and industrious, okay? Which would be reflective of high conscientiousness, okay? So it wouldn't necessarily be clear in one individual case which trait was impacting um, the particular outcome that I was assessing. And then lastly, there is T data. So these could be tests, like the projective tests we talked about last week um the, the Rochebach ink blot tests and so on um, but in research they're more often experiments okay so this could be some sort of experiment in which maybe you know it's maybe some game scenario in which participants can um share with each other be cooperative okay and i'm you know taking a, a note of how cooperative they are in this task or kind of how self-interested they are or in my own research um, working with children, looking at their temperament, I, for example, measured distractibility. Um, an experiment I used to measure distractibility was in one condition, I measured the children's reaction time to responding to keys on a keyboard. And then in another condition, there was distractions going on in the background. And I, again, measured their reaction time to the same task. And then I compared the two conditions, okay, to see how much they were influenced by the distractions. Okay, and that gave me some insight into their distractibility. So it could be, you know, some experiment, you know, you could be quite creative in how you came up with it. Okay, there's a number of different ways in which you could assess personality in an experiment. And we'll talk about, you know, some of the um, components of an experiment in a bit. Um, but it's some experiment or test that has, you know, the purpose of assessing an element of personality. Now, the main disadvantage is that it's only assessing this characteristic in one context again, right? Again, what we really want when assessing someone's personality is an aggregation, right? Their average personality, an average overview of their thoughts, feelings, and behaviors in multiple contexts. We're not going to get that with just one experiment, okay? So the best way of minimizing data problems is to have multiple sources of data, okay? So in the example I gave you, you know, I had this experiment to measure the distractibility of the children, but I also gave them self-reports and I also had their parents assess their distractibility as well. So I, I had S data, right, um, informant reports and the T data, okay? So I had three sources of data. And what I want is to make sure that those individual sources are all largely in agreement, right? That they're all pointing in the same direction. OK, that there's a high correlation between them. Otherwise, it would indicate that maybe one of these measurements isn't actually measuring distractibility very well if it's not in line with the other measurements I have to assess this particular trait. So I'm going to talk more about reliability and validity, but you probably have a gist of what these mean, you know, um, 
the consistency of the measurement, how well it's actually measuring what I want it to measure. We're going to achieve better reliability and validity if we're gathering data at different times, okay? Because, you know, maybe your mood could impact your performance on a test or your performance on a questionnaire, okay? So if I'm having, you know, multiple um, measurements from multiple time points, it's less likely these sorts of factors will impact the results. Um, I can ask about behavior in different contexts, different scenarios, different points in time. Um, I can use measurements from more than one rater or source, like I've just said. Um, so again, this could be, you know, multiple informants, maybe, you know, maybe you're doing your own personality assessment of yourself, and maybe also a friend, maybe a relative, okay? And again, hopefully they'll all point in the same direction if I really want to understand what your typical personality is. And then a variety of methods as well, right? So the life outcomes, the tests, and the questionnaires, um, again, all hopefully pointing in the same direction. Um, is there any questions on any of these different types of data? Okay, oh, pretty straightforward. Okay. Um, so, you know, really what we want to make sure when we have a way of collecting data in personality research, but in psychology more broadly, is that our measurements are reliable and valid, right? So reliability can basically be interchange with consistency, right? I could use a ruler to measure a piece of paper a hundred times and I would get the same result every single time, okay? Because it's a consistent, reliable measurement, right? Now in psychology, the things we're measuring are much harder to measure, okay? We're dealing with more abstract ideas, right? We're trying to measure sociability and aggression and anxiety and so on, okay? It's not a hard science. We're not measuring things with great precision. We're not measuring things like heights and weights, okay? And so we have to be extra careful um, in the way in which we assess our measurements for reliability and validity. Um, and I'll talk more about this, but also it comes with some measurement error, of course. So reliability is, again, checking the consistency of our measurements, okay? Now, there's three main ways of checking for consistency. One is internal um, consistency or internal reliability, which is consistency across items, okay? So, you know, maybe I have a questionnaire for measuring shyness, Maybe one of the items is I feel embarrassed when people sing happy birthday to me. Maybe one item is, you know, I, I get nervous when I have to stand up in front of a crowd. Um, I find it hard to um, talk to strangers or meet new friends. Okay, and so, so on and so on. There's various items that in theory are all meant to be measuring shyness. Okay. Now, if they actually are measuring shyness, okay, there should be a good degree of consistency okay, and how one answers all of those questions, right? If one, in theory, is a shy person, then they should be answering strongly agree to all of these, to all of these, or at least most of these, right? And if they're not a shy person at all, they should be answering, you know, on the low end of, of all of these, okay? So there should be good consistency across items to how they're measuring. Um, now, Cronbach's alpha is the average correlation, okay? So if I have, you know, these items that I've just said, and, you know, maybe some more, so maybe, you know, eight questions measuring shyness, okay? What I want is good correlation, okay, between all of them, okay? Um, so I'm going to, again, talk more about what Cronbach's alpha is in a correlation, but it's going to be a number, okay, between negative one and plus one. If it's a negative number, it's a negative correlation. If it's a positive number, it's a positive correlation. The closer to zero it is, the weaker the relationship, the weaker the correlation. The closer to negative one, the stronger of a negative correlation it is. The closer to plus one, the stronger of a positive correlation it is. So what I want here is a high positive correlation, right? That would tell me that there's good consistency to how one is answering all of these questions. Um, and really what we look for in internal consistency is a correlation of about 0.8, okay? That would be the average consistency that we're looking for between all of these items that tell us, you know, one is answering consistently to all of these questions. And then test, retest, reliability is consistency across time. Okay. So if I'm theorizing that shyness is a stable trait, okay, that can be measured, then once I have my shyness questionnaire, 
if you complete it once and then again in six months and then again in eight months and then again in a year, your response should be relatively the, the same. Okay. So again, this is an average correlation, okay, between points in time. Okay. And again, we're looking for a correlation of about 0 0.7, 0 0.8. Okay. So again, a pretty high positive correlation. Okay. That tells us there's good consistency to this score across time. Okay. So if you do this shyness questionnaire multiple times. And then inter-rater reliability is consistency across raters, okay? Now, it would have to be the same measurement, okay? So this is likely going to be informant reports, okay? So maybe, you know, I'm asking someone to assess your personality. I give an informant report to, you know, your, your, your mother, one to your father, one to a friend, one to another friend, you know, and other relatives, whatever. And there's multiple raters, okay? Um, what I want, if this is a good measurement, for measuring someone else's personality or shyness, whatever it is that we're looking at, there should be good consistency between all of the raters, right? And again, we're looking for a high positive correlation between them. Um, does that make sense? Is there any questions on any of these different types of consistency, reliability? Okay. So certainly in the quiz and the exam, there will be questions making sure you can tell these apart, explain them, identify them from each other, okay? Um, now, validity is the extent to which something is actually measuring what we want it to measure, okay? You know, if I have this um, questionnaire for measuring shyness, is it actually measuring shyness or is it measuring emotional stability or is it, you know, measuring something else that's on, not exactly what I want it to measure, okay? It has to be measuring what I actually intended for it to measure. Now, th there's there's many different ways of conceptualizing validity or categorizing validity measurements. Um, one of the most common of which is face validity. D does it seem valid on the face of it? So this would be basically just using common sense. So, you know, going back to this example of a shyness questionnaire, you know, using just common sense, do these items seem like they're actually measuring shyness? Do they seem relevant? Okay, do they seem like they're tapping into um, what would be shy behavior? Okay, or do they seem completely unrelated to shyness, which would be, you know, poor face validity? Um, but for the purposes of this course, there's three main types of validity I want you to understand and be familiar with. Um, the first is congruent validity. So does it align with other measurements of the same construct? Okay. So maybe I've developed the shyness questionnaire, but there's already a shyness questionnaire that's been published and it's already used in the research. Okay. And it's been proven to be valid. If my brand new shyness questionnaire is also valid, there should be strong agreement between this questionnaire and the one that's already published, right? So this again could be checking for a high correlation, okay, between the score on my questionnaire and the one that's already been published, okay? So congruent validity, okay, that it's congruent, that it's associated with other measurements of the same thing, okay? Now, discriminant validity is basically the opposite, okay? That it's not related, it's not measuring concepts that we know are unrelated to this particular trait, okay? That there's clear disassociation between what I'm intending to measure and this unrelated thing, okay? So for example, we know from a number of studies that extroversion and emotional stability have a correlation of about zero. They're completely unrelated, okay? You can be extroverted and emotionally stable or emotionally unstable. You can be introverted and emotionally stable or unstable, okay? One has no bearing on the other, okay? So if I've developed a questionnaire for measuring extroversion, then knowing that the association with emotional stability should be pretty close to zero, right? If I give the person my new extra version questionnaire and then a, a questionnaire for emotional stability that's already established, okay, there should be clear disassociation, a correlation that's very, very low, okay? And then predictive validity is if we're measuring something that's actually real, okay, then it should be able to predict differences in outcomes, differences in behaviors, okay? So for example, maybe I have a questionnaire for measuring IQ, okay? Measuring intelligence. It should be able to actually predict real life differences, right? 
those who score high on this IQ questionnaire should maybe do better in school in comparison to those who do worse on the questionnaire. Or if I give the participants a challenging puzzle, okay, then those who scored highly on the questionnaire should do better on the challenging puzzle than those who scored low. They should be able to actually predict some outcome, okay, that's a difference between people who scored differently on the questionnaire. Any questions on those? Do they make sense? Yeah. Okay, so discriminant validity is making sure it's not associated with something, okay, that we know isn't associated with the construct we're measuring, right? So the example I gave was the fact that extroversion and emotional stability are not related, okay? So we know that from decades of research on multiple participants and multiple measurements, okay? We know that these two things are uncorrelated, okay? So if I have a brand new measurement for extroversion, it should be unrelated to emotional stability, okay? Because we know those things are unrelated. <clears throat> Any other questions? Okay. And then in terms of the research that we do in personality, there's really three main approaches. The first is the case study method, okay? In which you evaluate one person at a time in depth, okay? Trying to make sense of their personality, why they are the way that they are, okay? Maybe what contributed to their personality. So this gives us pretty enrich, um, in-depth data, okay? That might especially be useful when it comes to quite unique behaviors that you really would find it difficult to kind of study in large samples to make, you know, statistical generalizations about. So in forensic psychology, for example, you know, a number of researchers have looked in depth in the cases of serial killers, okay, or, you know, other pretty unusual extreme criminals, okay, trying to go in depth in their backgrounds, looking for what might have went astray in their development, what have led to this really extreme behavior, okay? And then maybe they look at the fact that this person had a really bad upbringing, for example, maybe, and then maybe they might make a conclusion that, you know, that's maybe what contributed to their, you know, hostile view of the world, for example. But obviously the main drawback of a case study method is that it's going to be a subjective conclusion, right? We can't prove, for example, that in the example I gave, that the bad upbringing was what caused the person to be a serial killer, for example, okay? We can't demonstrate causality or that one variable definitely had an effect on an outcome. All we can do is make an interpretation, okay? A conclusion that's based upon maybe, you know, professional experience, but also some guesswork and maybe some, you know, deductions. <clears throat> so certainly, you know, different researchers could come to different conclusions, even when looking at the same thing, right? Um, Sigmund Freud did a case study of Leonardo da Vinci, came to the conclusion that he was secretly homosexual, okay? But other people have looked at the exact same background information, the exact same data, and then disputed Freud's conclusion, okay? Because interpretations will differ, okay? So it's open to subjectivity, this approach. The only method out of these which allows us to demonstrate cause and effect or causality is the experimental method. Okay. I'm going to go into more detail on this. Um, but this is when we can actually, in experimental conditions, test for the impact that one variable has because we can make sure that everything else is the exact same. Okay. So if I'm making a comparison between two groups, for example, Everything is the same except this one variable. And so if there's a difference in outcomes in these two groups, it has to be because of this one variable, okay? Because it's the only thing that's different. And then the final method is our correlational method, okay? Seeing if two variables are related to one another, if there's a correlation, is one goes up, does the other go down, or is one goes up, does the other go up? Okay, again, I'm going to talk in more detail about this, but it can give us good insight into how variables might be related to one another, but it doesn't allow us to conclude anything about causality or cause and effect, okay? Um, you know, you've probably heard this, right? Correlation doesn't imply causation, okay? There might be confounding variables, there might be variables um, other than these two that are 
responsible for the connection. And we don't know which variable is having an influence on the other in a correlation as well. You know, um, you know, for example, there's a negative correlation between happiness and anxiety, right? Um, it's a correlation of about negative 0.12. So, you know, the happier you are, typically the less anxious you are, but which is causing the effects on the other, right? Is being more anxious causing you to be less happy or is being more happy causing you to be less anxious, right? It's a relation, but we can't say that they're necessarily um, one's causing an effect on the other. Okay, so in an experimental method, in a true experiment, right, there's um, maybe two groups, an experimental group, a control group, and again, everything is the same, okay, except for the IV, okay? The IV is the variable that we're manipulating, okay? So everything else in these two conditions is the exact same, okay? Um, you know, so maybe, for example, I want to know, does going to private school versus public school have an impact on your intelligence, okay? And so I have an experimental group, okay, who are students at a private school, and then a control group, which is students at a public school, okay? And in a true experiment, everything would have to be the exact same, okay? In a true experiment, one has to be randomly allocated to one of the conditions, okay? So in a true experiment, it would be the case that, okay, this person's the private school group, this person's the public school group, this one's the private school group, and so on. They would be randomly allocated, and everything else would have to be the same. And the independent variable is the one that we're changing. So in this case, the school they attend. And the dependent variable is the outcome variable that we're measuring. Okay, so in this case, intelligence. Okay. So most often, the dependent variable or DV is going to be some personality trait in personality research. And we want to know does this IV have an impact on this particular personality trait? Okay. But it could be the other way around. You could have um, maybe a group of extroverts and a group of intro introverts and see if there's some difference in, in some outcome that you have. <clears throat> um, okay. Um, so like I say, in a true experiment, everything is the exact same other than the IV. It's the only thing we're changing. It's the only thing we're manipulating. Um, obviously, there's many problems with that. Okay, you're trying to keep everything the same other than this one variable. And we're going to come to that on the next slide. Um, and how we make conclusions based upon the experimental method is the probability of which the results, if there is a difference between these conditions, is due to the IV and not due to something else, okay? Like I said before, in psychology, what we're measuring is pretty abstract, okay? We're not measuring things with scales and with tape measurements, okay? We're trying to measure things that are more abstract, and so there's more measurement error. Okay, there's going to be more room for error in a questionnaire than there is in a ruler, for example. So, in psychology, we're never a hundred percent certain in our conclusions. Okay, even in an experiment. So that's why, and even in an experiment in psychology, we don't use the word prove. Okay, we use the word support in terms of a hypothesis. Now, the probability regarding the strength of our results is demonstrated to us via the p-value or probability value, okay? This is a number ranging from zero to one, okay? If it's one, there's a 100% chance that the results are due to error, okay? Or due to something other than the IV, okay? So that's obviously what we wouldn't want to see if we're looking for support of a hypothesis. If it's zero, okay? that's 0% chance that the results are due to error or due to something other than the IV, okay? So in that case, we're 100% confident. But like I just said, in psychology research, we're never 100% certain, okay? So the p-value is never zero, okay? The p-value is never exactly zero in psychological research. So what we need is a kind of benchmark, if you like, okay? A kind of point on which we can say, well, this is acceptable, okay? And in psychology, universally, the score which is accepted is 0.05, okay? A 5% chance that the results are due to error or due to something other than the IV, okay? If it's higher than 0.05, okay, so the closer it is to one, um, then that's a higher probability 
that these are not true results, okay, that they're due to some error. Okay, if they're 0 0.05 or less, then there's a 5% chance or less than 5% chance that the results are due to error. And we call that statistically significant, okay? So we accept that as supporting a hypothesis. So this is why in psychological research, it's so important that research needs to be replicated, right? Because if I have a statistically significant finding in support of my hypothesis, maybe with a p-value of 0.04, okay? There's still a 4% chance that the results are due to error, okay? And so that's why other researchers need to do the same study to find the same findings, okay? And once more and more research has all been done pointing in the same direction, okay, then we have confidence that these are true findings, okay? So, like I said, in a true experiment, everything is the same except for the IV and participants are randomly allocated, okay? But that's not always going to be possible, right? And the example I gave, if I was looking for a, for a difference between public school children and private school children, for example, it, it's less likely that I've randomly allocated them to these groups as the researcher, and more likely that I'm finding students who went to a private school and students who went to a public school and then doing a comparison, okay? So this would be called a quasi-experiment, okay? In which the participants have not been randomly allocated, okay? It's some kind of pre-existing difference, okay, that the researcher isn't actually manipulating, but they're making a, a comparison. And so in a quasi-experiment, we can't conclude causality, okay, because there is so many extraneous variables, which are variables out with the researcher's control, okay, that might be impacting the DV. So, you know, if I'm making a random, um, if I'm making a comparison, between private school children and public school children, right? And I haven't randomly allocated them. I'm just making a comparison between these two groups. Obviously, on average, there's going to be other things different between these two groups, other than the fact that one group goes to a private school, one goes to a public school. There might be a difference in location of where they live. There'll be a difference in socioeconomic status, okay? So these would be extraneous variables, okay? On average, there are other differences that exists on average between the two groups, okay, that may also be impacting the DB. Now, in reality, a quasi-experiment is sometimes the only option to us, right? Maybe I want to know, does being abused as a child have an impact on depression later in life, okay? Um, so the IV is whether one was abused or not as a child, the independent variable, and the dependent variable is depression that I'm measuring later. Obviously, as a researcher, I can't randomly allocate participants to one of these groups, okay? I can't say, well, you're going to be abused and you're not and so on, okay? That would obviously be unethical. But unfortunately, some children are abused. And so after the fact, we can collect a group of participants who say that they were abused as children and some who say that they weren't and make a comparison between them, okay? But that's going to be a quasi-experiment because as the researcher, I've not randomly allocated them, okay? And there's likely going to be some extraneous variables, right? Again, maybe differences in location, geography, socioeconomic status, some other possible differences that may exist on average between these two groups. Does that make sense? Is there any questions on the experimental method? Okay. Um, the other main methods, and this is the most popular method in psychological research, is the correlational method, in which what we're looking for is a correlation or relationship between two variables, okay? So this could be two personality traits, like I said, happiness and anxiety or extroversion and emotional stability. And what we want to know is are they correlated, meaning as one goes up, does the other go up? As one goes down, does the other go down? Or do they have no bearing on one another, okay? As one goes up or down, does it make no difference to the other? Um, so like I said, this is demonstrated to us via a number called the correlation coefficient, also sometimes called small r in italics. Um, it's a number from negative one to plus one. If it's a negative number, it's a negative correlation, okay? Meaning as one goes up, the other goes down. If it's a positive number, it's a positive correlation, meaning as one goes up, the other goes up. And if it's zero, there's zero relationship, okay? One um, has no impact on the other whatsoever. Um, so I'll give you just a couple of visual illustrations of this. There's 
there's various ways of determining the strength of a correlation, but this is one. Again, if it's you know zero, there's zero relationship. Um, negative one plus one would be a perfect relationship. Um, in reality, this is very unlikely to see because it would basically mean that these two things are essentially the same, right? If there's a perfect correlation. Um, but a strong correlation, typically anything above kind of 0 0.6, 0 0.7, moderate correlation, anything kind of close to 0 0.4, and then a weak correlation would be between 0 and 0 0.3 or neg negative 0 0.3 and 0. Um, you could look at this on a graph, okay? Quite often it's demonstrated via a scatter plot. So we have one variable on the y axis, so maybe happiness, and one variable on the x axis, um, so maybe depression um, or um, anxiety was the example I gave before. So maybe um, happiness and anxiety. And then we have the individual score, right? So this is one person's score, their score for anxiety, their score for happiness, okay? And then by looking at this, we can see the average relationship, the correlation. So, you know, if you imagined a line of best fit through the line, through the, the, the different dots, the different scores, is it moving in an upward direction, which would be a positive correlation as one goes up, the other goes up. If it's moving in a downward relationship, um, that would be a negative relationship, right? As one goes down, the other goes down. Oh, yeah, um, you can come back after, though. It was, yeah, no worries. Thanks. It's some of the hardware. Um, and then what we're also able to get um, insight into is the strength of the relationship um, by looking at the graph, OK? So again, imagining this line of best fit, um, the closer they are to the line, OK, the stronger the relationship, and then the further away they are from the line, the weaker um the relationship so if they're all perfectly on this line that would be a perfect correlation in this case you know plus one it's a positive correlation um this would be still relatively high they're pretty close to this line of best fit um and then a medium correlation you know we can see they're still relatively close okay but you can see that they're further apart than the other two illustrations um Another thing that we can calculate from the correlation coefficient is the variance, okay, which is the amount of variance in one variable that can be explained by the other variable, okay. This is r squared, meaning that you get this number just by timesing the correlation coefficient by itself. So to give you an example, um, there is a correlation of 0.4 between the personality trait conscientiousness and university grades, okay. It's a correlation being found again and again across studies. It's at point 0.4, okay? So what that means is if we times point 0.4 by point 0.4, it's 16%, right? Mm -hmm. So conscientiousness explains 16% of the variance in university grades, okay? It's explaining 16% of the difference in university grades, okay? That's because those who are more conscientious, more likely to um, go to class, more likely to turn assignments in on time, more likely to use their time productively, less likely to procrastinate. Um, but obviously, it's not explaining everything, right? It's, it's explaining 16% of the variance. It's you know some insight into why there's difference in university grades, but it's not the full insight. There's other factors too explaining the remaining variance, right? Intelligence, how much you like the subject, um, other things going on in your life, and so on. So there's a whole range of other factors explaining why there's difference in university grades. But this is one um, factor explaining some of the puzzle, right? Um, another one would be height and weights, okay? Height and weights reliably has a correlation of 0.6, okay? So um, 0.6 times itself, 36%, right? So by knowing someone's um, height, we can explain 36% of the difference in weights as well, okay? And then obviously there's other factors that would help us explain the remaining variance. Okay, but like I said, correlation doesn't mean causation, okay? Um, in some cases, this doesn't matter. All we need to know is that some variables are related. 
Okay, so I, I gave you the example that conscientiousness is related to university grades. Okay, it doesn't matter that we can't demonstrate causality. The fact that that's a reliable finding still tells us something useful. Okay, that these two variables are related. Okay, um, that gives us some insight into what makes one perform better at university, for example. Um, so we don't always have to demonstrate causality for this to still be insightful, useful information. Um, but, you know, it might not demonstrate causality because sometimes there's a third variable that we're not looking at that's actually explaining the association. So to give you an example, um, as ice cream sales go up in this country, homicide rates also go up. Okay, it's a reliable correlation that's found. Um, why is that? <clears throat> Are they directly related? Does eating more ice cream cause one to be more homicidal? Um, obviously not. There's something else explaining the relationship, right? Does anyone know what it might be? Eating ice cream and homicide rates. So what might cause homicide rates to go up and ice cream sales to go up? Sorry? One more thing. Okay. Um, well, that would be a death. Um, but yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Sorry? Um, I mean, if you just like ice cream, like compared to the ones that. Okay. But I think you are all looking at this on an individual by individual basis. So what I'm talking about is, you know, a, a general finding across the country, okay? as we look at the average homicide rates on a given day, okay, the average ice cream sales on a given day also grow up across the country. Yeah. yeah. Right, it's temperature, right. As temperature goes up, ice cream sales go up, of course, and as temperature goes up, people get more kind of um, hostile and more irritable and so on. And so reactive aggressions increase, including homicides. Okay, so there's a uh, there's a, a variable that we're not measuring, okay, that's actually responsible for the association. Um, I'll, I'll give you another example. Um, if we look at the number of Nobel Prizes won by a country across the world, okay, it correlates with the um, number of chocolate bars um, purchased within that country, okay? So is there a is there, a, is there a clear direct relationship there? Does eating more chocolate cause people to win more Nobel Prizes? Again, obviously not. There's some other variable rights that's responsible for the association. Any ideas? Sorry? The amount of money that's necessary. Perfect, right. It's the amount of wealth, right? Countries with more money usually have more money to spend on things like chocolate bars and also money to put into scientific discoveries that win Nobel Prizes and so on. Um, okay, and you know you could go on this. Sometimes two variables that we can find are reliably correlated, but they're not directly tied to one another. Okay, there's some other variable explaining the association. Um, and then in other cases, it might be pretty clear that these two things are related, but we still don't know which is causing the effect on the other, right? I gave you the example of um, anxiety and happiness, right? Two things related, but we don't really know which causes impact on the other, right? Okay, just to check your learning, I'll give you some um, examples. So, you know, a, a developmental psychologist believes that if children successfully lie to their friends, they will be more likely to try lying to their parents. To test this, the researcher asks 50 children to report how many times in the last month they lied to their friends, um, and then how many times they lied to their parents. Is this going to be a correlation or an experiment? Correlation, why? Well, the two things are related, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, again, we're seeing if there's a relationship as one goes up, does the other go up and so on. Um, yeah, perfect. Um, pharmacologist is testing whether a new anti-anxiety medication will cause people to gain weight. So she gives 100 people this new medication for a month and then 100 people a placebo drug, and then at the end monitors weight gain. Okay, correlation or experiment? Experiment, right? Because there's a clear IV, a clear comparison in two conditions, right? Uh, what would the IV be or independent variable? 
the drug, right? Because in one condition, there's the drug, and one group, there isn't. Um, and then what's the DV or dependent variable? Right, the weight gain, yeah. Okay, so after that, you should be able to describe the main types of ways of collecting data, the various strengths and weaknesses, reliability and validity in the three examples of each that I gave, um, and then the main approaches to personality research, okay, the case study method, experimental and correlational, and the strengths and weaknesses. Is there any questions on anything I've covered to do with research methods? Um, I am going to make a start on um, Freud when we finish. 